This is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. We are excited for this guest episode to host Chris Stefanik. Thanks so much for joining us on God's Planning. Oh, man, it's so good to be with you guys. Sorry it, was, it took so long to schedule this. <laughs> That's all right. Our, our listeners and or viewers don't know how long the scheduling process is. So for them, right. all content is fresh, as fresh as fresh can be. That's right. Um, and I, I just wanted to tell them how much you suffer for a love of them. <laughs> it, it's not really us. It's Mary, you know, who's doing the scheduling. So we're in a good place, too. So <laughs> no, no need Thank to you, Mary. Thank yeah, you, exactly. Mary. That yeah. was good hey. of you guys to, to actually give credit where it's due. I usually just take credit for all the things that my staff does. Well, see, when they, our staff doesn't really do a ton wrong, I think they're pretty good. But when they do mess up, we can at least blame them if we okay. give them credit. That's good. So I like that. Up, you know? They're a yeah. buffer between you and failure. That's right. <laughs> yes. Our policy, like the word of God, is a two-edged sword, right? It cuts both <laughs> ways. That's how Hebrews 4 goes. Um, right. Okay, so many of our listeners slash viewers will already know you. Uh, but for those who don't, would you say a, a word of introduction, who you are, where you're from, the type of cool things that you have found yourself involved in over the course of the past however many years? Yeah, Chris, Stefanik, uh, dad, grandpa, mm. oh, husband. Yeah. Now, some people are like, you look too young to be a grandpa. And I'm thinking, I, I feel too young to be married to a grandma. That's the wow. That's the weirder <laughs> part of the whole equation. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm an evangelist. I spend my life trying to focus on basics you know if you're and, and i think it's it's more important now than ever um if you're in a fight your your hands get kind of cold because your blood's rushing to your core to keep you alive if any anytime you feel an adrenaline spike that happens uh, i think right now is time for the church for all of us as individuals to to rush back to to the basics that we often presume or move past or lose sight of because what's urgent in life always crowds out what's important in life um, so I, I just I travel the world and preach the core message of the gospel and invite people to invite Jesus into their lives and and, um, and talk about how to live in his joy and then empower people to share that message as well with, with shareable media bits and uh, small group resources and coaching programs that that have a real life relevance that they wouldn't be afraid to share with their unreached friends. So that's my that's my life life mission. Boom. Okay. So I have like 17 follow-up questions, but I'll limit myself to one. Uh, yes. But in the course of explaining said oh, one follow-up question, I'll just probably keep talking. It's yeah. hard to say. Okay. So um, yeah, you bring a certain energy. You bring a certain vibe to evangelical things, to charismatic things. I think like a lot of Catholics in the West feel like they're just getting beat. Uh, to quote Lady Galadriel, it's as if we are fighting the long defeat. And, uh, yeah. you know, you might have signs or indicators of vitality over here or over there. But I think the overall vibe is, woof, we're just taking it on the jaw. So in your travels uh, and in your evangelical efforts, what's your kind of sense of things? Like, how are we doing? Maybe not as like an occasion of self-congratulations, but yeah, how are we doing for the Catholic who feels somewhat isolated and perhaps somewhat overwhelmed? <laughs> I like that. Don't don't self congratulate. Well, I'm doing great. Most of you guys do. <laughs> think. Um, no, but but I I do feel kind of spoiled um, in the in the place that God's called me to because there's, there's a lot of excitement and joy in charismatic core message of the gospel evangelization. Um, what I'm seeing constantly, like every single week, I go out and do these evangelistic events, uh, 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 builds my faith and surprises me. And it never stops surprising me. And I suppose if I had more faith, it wouldn't surprise me. Because as, as I see the, the core message of the gospel resonate with postmodern hearts uh, in ways that everything on Twitter tells us it shouldn't, I'm always delighted and amazed and encouraged. Um, but there's the, the, the message of the gospel has lost zero of its potency since the apostles started telling the world that Jesus is risen from the dead and that God is love and that he's calling you to a relationship with himself, literally none of its potency. Um, and, and when we lean into it, I, I, I see, I see churches full of people. I see lots of people who the pastor looks out and says, well, we have a big outreach plan before my events. He's like, I, I don't recognize half these people. And then I see, you can see transformation in people's faces uh, in response to the message of the gospel. So, you know, if I, if I spend too much time on social media, even doing this and getting this reminder from God every week, 
if I spend too much time on, on social media or on YouTube, I'm convinced that everyone is evil and everything's ending and, and no one hears Jesus anymore. Um, mm-hmm. When I'm out there with actual humans looking at them, I see the opposite is true. And I'm, uh, there's a lot of reason to hope because human hearts are still made for God. Not, nothing, not, the, the foundational truths haven't changed. Conversions yeah. are still happening, sometimes despite us. You know, as a church, despite our messiness. Uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged. I want you, if you're listening and you're losing that, that, uh, losing hope, I mean, always hope in the gospel, man. You know, be encouraged. Lives are still being changed. In your work, like in, in going around preaching the gospel, proclaiming the basics of the faith, I think, um, I don't know. I don't, maybe, maybe I shouldn't reveal too much, but one of the, I think, um, especially like peers, my brother priests who are peers were, were kind of getting close, not quite a decade ordained, but getting closer. And you kind of, um, one of the things I think that I, that I begin to be challenged by is how to preach the gospel, even in its basics in a way that's like new and fresh and exciting yes. for people, attractive for people. Um, and I think people in the pews too, um, obviously like preaching of the gospel for the laity is different. They're not in the pulpit every Sunday or every day, mm-hmm. but you know, spreading, spreading the faith, living the gospel, I guess in your work and your experience, what do you like, where do you find or yeah where do you find that spot where people are most ready to receive or most like receptive or like what are what yeah what what is it that is kind of like okay this is pricking hearts this is pricking minds this is where people are kind of latching on yeah um i, I want to comment on one one thing you said uh, that there's i think it's a, there's hesitancy to go there with basics from people but i think what's often presumed is the most important thing in life, in business, in any relationship. I'll never forget one time my mom, when I was a teenager, said, Jim, do you love me to my dad? And my dad was a completely not talkative guy. And he was kind of stunned. He's like, well, I don't, I don't cheat on you. I, I go to work. I provide for the family. He's like, yeah. She's like, no, no, Jim, I need you to say, I love you. Like, okay. I love you. Um, but there's, there's this presumption almost that if we preach about basic things, uh, that we might almost bore people. Uh, but there's, <laughs> We, we we just have to lean into the, to the fact that this is this is so totally necessary. I I, I think I think uh, the world's forgotten the basics. You know, it's it's kind of like within marriage that 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 core love relationship. There's a lot of things that come from the love relationship, right? But that come from the vows that couple exchange. There's the rules and regulations and and uh, the dates to remember and all those things. But they only flow from that 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 exchange of hearts and the, all the other things we do. We do so that we can uphold that initial exchange of hearts. Uh, if we move past it in, in a way that forgets where all that came from, then the marriage starts to feel like a big to-do list. It's exhausting. It's burdensome. It's joyless. This is the way so many Christians experience Christianity and the way so many non-Christians perceive our invitation to come to Jesus. It's, it feels to them like an invitation to, to add a to-do list to their lives that will take away their fun. Um, I, I love the uh, the Pope Francis quote, and uh, I, I don't I don't I don't have a big list of Pope Francis quotes that I that I particularly love, but this one is fantastic, and you could you could deduce what you want from that st- statement. Uh, but this is Evangelii Gaudium 164. I didn't say that. Did I say that? That was Father Gregory Pine's voice that just said that. cancel him. Um, no, seriously, it's absolutely gorgeous. Evangelii Gaudium 164. Uh, the kerygma must ring out over and over. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. Now he's living at your side. This first proclamation is called first, not because it exists at the beginning. and It can be forgotten or replaced by other more important things. It's first in a qualitative sense because it's the principal proclamation that we have to hear again and again. Um, so th- this is something that we just we never move beyond. Now, when, when and where do people receive it? Um, I think that the safest bet is all the time, wherever they're at. And then we just keep throwing those darts. And if people reject it, um, well, so be it. You know, uh, I had a, a cut me off anytime. I, I just talk incessantly, but I had a, uh, an event in Hawaii, um, that my father-in-law lives there and he's, he's 82 and the guy's a, just a hedonist, man. I'm, I'm late. He's like Keith Richards. Like I'm waiting for him to calm down. Um, and we, <laughs> he hasn't been baptized. And I talked him into coming to my event and I was 
dude, my stomach was, was just churning all day. So I know the fear people have when they, when they try to bring people in the door. Um, amazingly he totally loved the event and and i asked him which talk he liked more where i, I talked about how to be joyful and i talk I, I give a hard like you need god in your life and repent of your sin and come to jesus he's like i like that one better i'm like okay cool do you want to come to church and come to a small group there that they're inviting you to he's like don't push it i'm like <laughs> at some point buddy we should probably uh, push this conversation because you're 82 but anyway uh and he won't watch this podcast so there's no, <laughs> no risk of that. <laughs> uh pray for warner we love him to death but uh yeah if, if, if we're constantly going there and, and every other message that we teach or preach if we overtly i think more than ever we need to overtly draw those things back into the core message of the gospel um yeah yeah okay so um in recent conversations i would i've been talking to dominicans about a thing that I kind of made up called the new itinerancy. The basic idea is mm. you do something local and then you capture it and you project it global. But the point is ultimately to bring people mm. back local because there's mm. a certain risk that if you're just doing stuff for the internet, you only ever spend time on the internet. And like the yeah. internet isn't really a place. It just feels like a place. And so you don't actually meet people on the internet. You just feel like you yeah. meet people on the internet. Yeah. But it strikes me like in your ministry, you're doing a lot of bopping here and a bopping there and a bopping elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, but also you're, you're, you're doing some institution building too. And so far as you're getting people involved in kind of coaching or mentorship relationships. And so far as you're especially solicitous for the good of married couples and preparation and in kind of troubleshooting and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about like what comes next? So after the kerygma, you know, people yeah. are going to have to unpack this message to unpack this life and then undertake the work of ongoing conversion. And you're there to help them along the way. What are the, like some of the things that you've seen in that journey? Uh, first, I love the word local that you just used because if, it, if it's not tied to local, it's, it's pointless. I mean, there's like, what is there? I mean, all of life happens locally. All of life happens under our noses. And, and we live in this weird delusional uh, digital landscape where, we, where it, we forget that at our peril. Uh, and then we become, uh, we despair at, at life because the internet presents a humanity that's not actually accurate. It's, it, there, there's real problems, don't get me wrong. Um, but everything I, I do, I, I try to come back to that, that local mindset, like our, our reboot events, we work with parishes I go to for six months before I get there to, to, to have them be intentional about inviting their whole town back to church. So mm -hmm. there, there's parish centered events that typically get 500 to a thousand people, which is hard for a large region to draw. Uh, and, and it's not because I'm quote famous. It's be, my target audience is people who've never watched EWTN or listened to your podcast or know, or they don't know who I am, but someone invited them. Uh, because we we lean into that that team invite thing, and then I then I leave people with resources that make it less scary to share the faith and share them in small groups. Uh, but yeah, we we got to think local. We got to think small, or otherwise we're just feeding our egos, and that's easy to to fall into, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah it's 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 everywhere. It's it's a problem. <laughs> I mean, just yeah. look just look at Matt Frad. You, you know his his accent is Austrian <laughs> accent. His accent. He's actually he's from, from the, New Zealand. He's from the Bronx. He's actually from oh, the Bronx. Right, yeah. He just fakes the whole thing. It's a big act. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope he watches this. Yeah, he's, Brad, he it. started it so he could like uh, get into the audiobook business, but then he found he, greener pastures still in the Catholic podcasting. Uh, <laughs> that's right, mm -hmm. man. Um, yeah. But thanks for the slow pitch to the marriage program. I, I we we have various coaching programs. Uh, for lack of a better word, I don't love the word coaching, but it's not uh, academic in nature. These are these are things that just dive into helpful areas of, of your life. So where if you're a really devout Catholic, it's going to help you. And also, if you don't know the Lord, it's going to help you. Uh, so it, so it makes it uniquely shareable. Uh, but we have one dropping on um, April 1st. It's free for 45 days because if I don't put limits on those things, it becomes like a book that people just get and put in their shelf and never use. Uh, so I want to create panic around using it. Uh, reallifecatholic.com forward slash marriage link is in the show notes. I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm, I'm presuming that you're going to put the link. in. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, but we're going to, we cover in, in 21 days, um, just how to have a more amazing marriage in seven steps and there's different challenges for each day. So, but that's the kind of thing that when it's, it, it will, it will demonstrably make your life better that you're just less afraid to share with your friend who doesn't go to church. And that's the, we have, 
the devout person in mind, but also putting shareable stuff in their hands in mind. Since you're giving giving access for free um, for those for those marriage for that marriage coaching encounter whatever yeah. I was trying to think of a different word for you I was I was our vocation yeah, director for yeah, I was our vocation director for four years before I was up here at our parish and I I really don't like the word discernment and over the course of four years I couldn't find another word to use so I just oh I yeah just yeah I like coaching I get I get the struggle yeah um, I know what is what of those seven what's like a little sneak peek what's like number one what should couples be after if they're oh. looking to engage in their marriage more deeply oh gosh they're, they're, it really blew my mind doing this because it was a culmination of 25 years of marriage and i was just overcome with gratitude after filming this with my wife because it summed up so much of uh, how god's purified us in our in our path I, I you know i guess what's jumping up most right now is uh you know steps four and five about removing your armor and being healed um I, I ended up my marriage uh, thinking it would just be, you know, uh, a, a romantic relationship on crack. I mean, that's what marriage is, right? That just uh, you could just make love together and not have to worry about anything. And, you know, life is just perfect all the time and skip through fields with daisies. And um, my my wife is a, a victim of childhood sexual abuse. And, and 10 years into our marriage, the, the pain of that came out and she... It made me, in retrospect, realize that, oh, wait, for the past 10 years, things have been messed up and I wasn't courageous enough to look at it. And then it began a five-year healing journey that kicked up every wound in me. I mean, people think your wife is your healing balm when she is, in actuality, the diagnosing finger of God to push on all your wounds and breaks. I'm sure much like your religious community, fathers, um, right? That's what God, that's how community blesses us. Um, in In one of my lowest moments dealing with being the embodiment of everything that hurt her as a male, I uh, I just cried out to God. I'm like, Lord, why can't I have a normal marriage? Um, which, by the way, no one has. And I I just He turned that around and gave me perspective in that in an instant where I I realized people with a quote normal marriage will never know what it's like to experience the healing I'm experiencing, and they'll never know what it's like to have their wives walk through the fires of hell just to show up for you. Um, that. That wound became um, the greatest blessing in my life. I mean, there's, there's, of all the things I wouldn't trade in on my marriage, it's that healing journey and that, and that particular cross that we bore together. And everyone has one within their, within their marriage. Uh, I love the Chesterton quote: "Marriage is a duel to the death, which no man of honor should decline." Um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's so much pain, but those are precisely the, the points of blessing. Uh, and to reframe all these things and to, to help people carry that, the cross of one another with, with joy. <laughs> yeah. That's what comes to the top of my head as you, as you, <laughs> as you talk. Yeah. So there you go, folks. You've got steps four and five. Step one is cuddle. Step two is snuggle. <laughs> step three is sexual intercourse. And then step six and seven are actually snuggle and cuddle again. So um, That's right. you don't even need to take the course. We just gave it I to just you. It all up. <laughs> ours, is, ours is free only for 30 days. So <laughs> for ours faster kind of deal. That's it. Panic yeah. more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, I want to follow up specifically on um, this question of marriage. Mm -hmm. I, I heard, you know, this professor who taught at Duke say, here's the thing, you're going to marry the wrong person, get over it and move forward. And he didn't mean in the sense like, you know, the person across oh, yeah. from whom you're sitting at present is like the wrong individual, but in yeah. the sense that your thoughts of the perfect companion, the perfect partner, the perfect wife or husband often prove an obstacle to your actual embrace of the really blessed marriage that you have here. And then thinking like in kind of conversation with this idea, like God isn't motivated by need or by mm -hmm. service or by whatever else. It's not like he doesn't need us. He's not like looking to us to serve whatever kind of place in the kingdom of God that he can't fulfill directly, immediately. Rather, God is motivated by glory. So mm -hmm. thinking about like this idea of kind of gaining access to the glory of God through an embrace of the actual person whom you've married, flaws and all, uh, and then in, in confrontation with your own flaws, mm -hmm. can you just, yeah, maybe testify to a little bit of the glory that you've seen? Obviously, you've talked about your own relationship, um, but a little more of the glory that you've seen by, uh, yeah, like really kind of leaning in as it were. Well, the, the things I actually like most about myself, the, uh, are the things that have been 
come about through struggles and trials. I love asking people when I interview them on my show, if they've been through the ringer with something, what do you love about yourself because of that? Um, if you want to create a, a, a more beautiful, strong bicep, what you do is you put resistance on that particular muscle. And then you do reps and you put pain on that muscle. And I, and the Lord allows trials for us. And, and if you're listening right now thinking, man, God, God gave me that. Well, he doesn't cause the, the darkness and trial, but he does allow it, uh, particularly with a plan to put resistance on that part of you that you feel is abandoned. And whether it's a, a temptation or a wound, right? But, it, but he's hand picked that. He's allowed that for you because he wants to bring a particular strength and glory out of you that's not in other people that he'll enjoy seeing in you for all eternity. Uh, so that that lean in concept to it is is so key because I, and I, I met with a young adult the other day who's, uh, I, th- I think, struggling with a lot of um, addiction, addictive behaviors. And and, and when they, whenever they ex- experience the weakness in that area, it's, it's, it's the the gut level conclusion is, well, I've been, I'm abandoned by God in this area. No, no, it's literally the opposite. He's telling you, dude, you, you got to push on the rep. You're going to have awesome triceps. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> this is this is the glory that that he, he brings. He brings out of us. It's, it's through the trials. Did that answer the question? It begins to answer the question, but I suspect that we'll be answering the question for the rest of our lives. I love this line from Salvafici Dolores where John Paul II says, God doesn't answer this human questioning about the meaning of suffering once and for all or in the abstract. He answers it to the degree and extent that we become sharers in the suffering of Christ. So I suspect, you know, like each married couple is going to tell that story for themselves, but Mm -hmm. it's just something that takes time and that takes love. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, Uh, I remember. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you. I have to. I insist. It's so it's so key in the midst of the trials to, to just stay grateful through it all. I, I one topic I obsess about is joy. Here's another plug. I wrote a book on joy called Living Joy. Um, it, it, to to stay grateful, to stay a person of praise in the midst of it all. Um, well, one of my favorite scriptures is the joy of the Lord must be your strength, and that was told to the people of God in the in the context of a profound trial in their in their history. You know, when they were being called to go home and re- rebuild their fallen city of Jerusalem and maybe go to war, maybe die, and then they're given these laws of God, and they were their instant re- gut response was to mourn. And uh, the joy of the Lord must be your strength. We m- misperceive joy and happiness as a reward on the other side of whatever trial that we might be in. No, no, it's actually a call to war. It's, it's the necessary strength to get into the trial. Uh, but there's got to be intentionality. There's got to be intentionality about, about gratitude, about not taking each other for granted, about reframing how you see your trials as, as the blessing and as a, that next rep that you're pushing up. And if we don't do that mental work and, and align our thinking with the thinking of Jesus Christ, you know, put on the mind of Jesus, as, as Paul tells the Philippians, uh, we might get through it. But, man, we'll be weak. Without joy, we're weak. One of the, you mentioned too, and, and one of the things um, that I like to, I don't know, soapbox of mine or what I like to harp on a little bit, um, well, two things that I'm thinking of right now is one, um, you know, I think I think social media, as you already mentioned, is like the, the evil of all evils. I think it destroys our ability to have relationships and en- engage in in reality in particular. And I remember, Father, if you if you care to hear me complain for half an hour, uh, you can listen to our episode that we did on the Camino after we did the Camino, Father Gregory mm. and I and a group of pilgrims. But um, one of the cool parts uh, or one of the cool things that we did <laughs> was at the end of the Camino, we we were kind of reflecting on, on mm. our experience with the group of pilgrims. And Father Gregory mentioned, and I'm paraphrasing, but he's here so he can correct me if I'm wrong. But one of the beauties about the Christian life is that it allows us to enter into the realities of the things that are good and joyful and beautiful without Mm -hmm. having to like fake them. And the same thing with the difficulties of our lives, Mm -hmm. you know, we can enter and lean into what is difficult and broken without having to mask or facade, you know, it, Christ frees us to, to live reality. Um, and as you're talking about marriage and evangelizing and living the Christian life and the basics of our life, I think a lot of times what people come up against is the fear of like the reality of who they are and having to face that, you know, that's mm-hmm. not new, but I think it's more difficult now, given all of the ways that we're able to like mask and hide and like mm-hmm. most of kind of contrived picture online and pretend that's real and that sort of thing. So I don't know. Do you, do you, I'm, I'm sure you encounter engage that, but um, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts on that? What do you think that people yeah. need to hear know with respect to, I guess, having the courage to to be vulnerable in ways? 
Yeah, well, when people think Christian joy, the first thing to think of is someone with a fake smile. Right, right. Mm. I mean, like I'm going into my nearest non-denominational church lobby, and there's someone waiting for me with a cup of coffee and a big fake smile. You know, mm. uh, and I, I don't mean to pick on non-denoms here, uh, but there's there's that perception that uh, sometimes sometimes it's it's true, right? Sometimes it, it, we we heap levels of denial on on top of ourselves, and you can't talk about the problems. Christian joy is actually the capacity to face your pain in a healthy way. And not have to medicate it because you have you have a you have something anchoring you uh, beyond your circumstances and the happiness you might seek in your circumstances. I, I love what Jesus told the apostles: "No one will take away your joy." He told them that, knowing full well they were going to die gruesome deaths. <laughs> so this isn't this isn't just passing happiness. Um, one of the things on our our coaching platform that we're releasing April first, uh, the program I did on joy, um, I, I did this 20, twenty-one part I think on joy. The moment we stopped filming it, my phone rang, and, and the timing was just the Lord saying, let's practice what you preach. Uh, it was my oldest daughter, and she said, Dad, I have MS. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was, it was devastating. It was, way, it was more devastating when we were kids, for the record. There was no medicines really to help it. Now there's different options, but it's, it's a wild ride. I mean, it's, it's playing whack-a-mole. Um, lots of adrenaline, man. I drove home, and I just asked, how, how are you doing? Uh, and I'll never forget, she sat there quiet for a minute, and then she said, I'm, I'm being called. I said, called to what? She said, I'm being called to be joyful and to be peaceful and to be courageous. And that's not a bad calling for my life. Um, there wasn't a denial of pain in that moment. There, there was actually, we we're sitting in the darkness together, you know, and asking, how are you? And the pain, the pain coexists with the joy of Christian life. And that's the beauty of the gospel you know that we have a and this is this is why we have to tie the charisma the core message of the gospel into every message um overtly not not just imply that people know the connections but we overtly spell it out for them because they we need to hear it again and again whether we're teaching something about ethics or we're we're encouraging people to stay joyful uh, that life is inherently good because of that core message and that even when we're in the midst of pain and suffering, that that's caught up into a bigger story, that the pain and suffering is not the story, that the story for life is not MS. The story for life is uh, that there's a God. He loves us. He, he created us for, for a purpose that's good, that he suffered and died for us. He rose from the dead and conquered death. He destines us for eternal glory. Um, that's not part of the story. That's the, that's the story. That's it. And MS or, or cancer or divorce or whatever trial someone is in the middle of is literally reduced to a page in in that story um this is the best news mankind's ever ever or will ever receive this is it this is the best thing ever you know and and as a church we just got to get uh, obnoxious about repeating it again and again to people <laughs> today with what you know and, and all the all the stuff i talk about whether it's marriage or joy or whatever it's it's a uh, it's opening the back door to getting that message out there, you know, mm-hmm. that, that Jesus is what you need to make your life better. My gosh, half the confusion in the church right now comes from, I, I think, a lack of conviction in that corp. I think th- this is the crisis, a crisis over the kerygma. If people are getting soft on, on church teachings when it comes to things like sexual ethics or how to pastor people who are same-sex attracted, or um, I, I think it's because a lot of people at every level in the church have lost the conviction that what Jesus offers you is just simply so much better. And that life with him is just so much better than anything else. Yeah, I think a lot of folks expect too much and they expect too little. In the sense that like they expect the wrong kind of things, like too much of, you know, positive emotion or psychological equilibrium or Mm -hmm. the kind of satisfaction of whatever desires as they are presently experienced. But then Mm -hmm. they expect too little and that I don't think they expect enough of God, like Mm -hmm. God. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Last thing. So last question. I, I mean, so in, in a difficult situation, like the one that you just described, I think, you know, we go to prayer, we ask the Lord what's going on. We ask the Lord why we ask the Lord to make sense of our experience. And um, I think a lot of us hear nothing, uh, which is entirely in keeping with what we've come to expect from Christian life, because like the way that, you know, like say some of our contemporaries who feel pressure to always be happy because that's the kind of proof that Christianity is true, but then we end up thinking their happiness to be a little bit inorganic or artificial and it actually repulses us. Okay. So there's like, Again, sometimes we're talking to those people. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, it just <laughs> it just keeps coming up, coming to mind as the perfect example yeah. for. Yeah. yeah, these things, they just, they present themselves. I mean, who am I but to seize on the opportunity? Um, but I think that, that like when those people describe, when those people describe their experience of prayer, they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. And when I hear that, I think like, what is that even? I, just, I, don't, I don't even know what that means because my experience of like the Lord speaking to me is different. It's just entirely different. And I could go into that, but it's not for here or now, but kind of like where, like in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of trials and temptations, as you experience this kind of vocation to joy emerge organically within the setting of your, you know, admittedly flawed life, uh, like where does the Lord speak to you? Like what concrete places or what concrete ways do you hear him invite you further up and further in? You know, what's coming to mind right now is um, as I as I lean into the just the joy of, of Christian life. And I, and I think joy, joy and sadness, joy and suffering can coexist, right? I love, I love body surfing. And I'll, I'll note that if there's a large wave coming at me that I'm afraid to catch, I just dive down and grab the sand. Uh, at the surface, in the same water, there's an eight-foot wave. And two feet under, it's totally still. I mean, these, these things coexist. Um, I, I've, I've cried at a funeral where at the same time as despair in the natural, um, which is actually... You know, I, I'm literally despairing. I'm not hoping grandma sits up. I'm, I'm actually hoping she does not sit up. Uh, she's gone, right? At the same time, I have hope. So the, you got these, we got these things coexisting. And it's that, that deeper level of spiritual joy, spiritual hope that gives us the capacity um, to not have to fix everything in this life. Uh, so one of the greatest ways that the Lord well, speaks to me, I don't, maybe that's the wrong way to say it, uh, is is in in suffering i i used to have a tendency just to squirm out of it and i think that's human nature you know we we're, we're genetically hardwired biologically hardwired to squirm away from pain um and then I, what happens then is i get dysfunctional or too busy or, or just do too much ministry for the lord even i just can't stop thinking about new things to do or new projects and lately i i've just felt the call and, and maybe that's the lord speaking I, it's, it's a way to say it to when I feel that inner darkness or pain, just to sit there and say, Jesus, come sit with me here in the dark. And uh, I love the psalm, which never struck me as joyous before, but really does now. Uh, Out of the depths I cry to you, hear me, O Lord. And uh, I'm just going to be comfortable sitting here and not squirming and be in pain with you, Jesus. Uh, there's a weird joy in that that I, I can't, I don't know how to describe that. But you know what I'm talking about. If you I know, you know. Understand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks on that asking. note, which, yeah, no, thanks for answering that. I think that's like, that's where it cashes out. That's where it gets most real because mm -hmm. to a certain degree or extent, we can set forward universal truths, but in their particular application, I think a lot of people experience the, the hindrances or the obstacles in their own lives, which keep them from embracing that. And mm -hmm. I think like a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching is helping to people like to translate these universal truths to their own particular application and saying like, no, it's, it's real, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't just exist in the inapplicable ether. It actually cashes out. I mean, that's crass, but like it actually yeah. applies right, and right. Uh, it'll mean, you know, like that. But I think a lot of that's just testimony. Yeah. It's so, like stained glass windows on the outside. They just... They just don't look the same. And you come inside the church and it's like, whoa, I get it now. You know, I could describe yeah. them to you. Um, <clears throat> yeah. 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 But you need your experience lit up by faith, sacrament, that's, and the witness it. of the saints. That's it. Praise God. All right. We're at the end of our time. So can you put in a, a final word? Uh, can you fill our show notes with recommendations of resources and places in which people can follow up? Yeah, thanks for saying that. I love you. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, reallifecatholic.com forward slash marriage. I'd be honored to share that program with your with your people. Uh, or just if you go to reallifecatholic.com, we have a great new coaching platform that that's, covers marriage, uh, how to forgive, how to overcome fear. That's really, really quality stuff. We're just rolling out. I'm very excited about it. And it's also uh, it's also going to be how we just keep keep our work going forward. We um, we we've, my gosh, given away millions of dollars worth of Catholic media. So um but yeah, it's all there. Reallifecatholic.com. You can sign up for the newsletter and, and you'll you'll get our, our weekly show. We have, I have a daily podcast with Pat Lencioni called The Three Minute Reset. Um, Pat's a, a renowned business author. Um, I have a, uh, yeah, just lots of stuff. It's all, on, it's all on the website. Sign up for the newsletter. Sign up for that marriage coaching program. And uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for the permission to plug. And uh, don't follow Matt Fratt. Follow Chris Stefanik on YouTube. 
Uh, it's, it's exactly. Yeah. Go totally. back. Go back to the Pints channel. Unsubscribe. Yeah. <laughs> Push that <laughs> bell in that's reverse. What I'm yeah, because it's yeah. way better if I actually literally take a subscription and add to exactly. mine than to just get a new subscription. Be, uh, because a rising tide does not raise all ships. That's right. You have to think, yeah. as the Lord taught us, in a scarcity mindset. Uh, it's it's <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> As we learned in our dialectical God materialism God. class. Yeah, you cannot serve two masters, you know? That's it. That's right. Pick one. Uh, you know, what the heck? While yeah. you're at it, unsubscribe from this podcast and subscribe. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. All right. And put in a I mean, bad comment and yeah, a bad it, review. As you leave. Hey, we'll take comments. doesn't matter. It's all good. Yeah. I'm going to burn this down. End quote. Chris <laughs> Nice. <laughs> uh, it's been an honor and blessing talking to you guys thank you thanks yeah uh, thanks for I making the time that. we appreciate and it and i know you guys are, you guys are clearly brilliant humans uh and it's 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 um it takes a lot <laughs> it takes a lot to uh, uh to formulate questions as you are like there's, there's so much going on i know either each of you could probably jump in and just dominate the floor for a half hour of of, of, of talking and um thanks for culture uh, cultivating the gift of listening and drawing out things that i maybe hadn't been thinking of that are going to make my day better so yeah thank you yeah awesome our joy we find that the conversation is often one easier to listen to but also more engaging i think the people are looking to be included in conversations about holy things because they haven't yet learned how to be involved in conversations about holy things and i think that insofar as it does this ought to lead to prayer because that is the highest form thereof so Amen. Amen. Thank All right. We're going to turn to the listener and close things out. So thanks as always for listening to God's planning. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, maybe TikTok until the United States Congress makes that impossible. And then we will all rejoice corporately and never recommend it again. Uh, like the episode, subscribe on YouTube or your podcast app and leave a five star review, all of which does things. I don't know what it does, but I believe that it does the things that people say that it does. Uh, if you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, please follow the link in the description and our show notes in the same description and or show notes. You'll follow links for Christophanic stuff, which we have heard to this point. Uh, but you also see links for merchandise and then in information on upcoming God's Planning events. So we got the, uh, the retreat there coming up in the beginning of June and then a men's retreat coming up in the middle of August. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on God's Money.